Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Phil Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today and take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. Hey, y'all. This is episode 94 of Reclaiming the Faith. This is part two of a three-part series I'm doing on TULIP versus the early Christians. Essentially, I'm looking at what the earliest Christians would have to say about the five points of Calvinism known as total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And in this episode, I'm going to be looking at specifically unconditional election and limited atonement. If you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a rating and review on my Apple podcast channel, Reclaiming the Faith. Also, I want to let y'all know that just a few days ago, I released a new album called Kingdom Come, and you can buy this uh, 10-song album on iTunes or Amazon Music, anywhere that digital music is um, available for, for purchase or streaming. So go check that out, please. Bill Baker, Kingdom Come. I'm blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency, along with BDK and Kurt, who do such an awesome job every week, giving you much content on the Omega Frequency YouTube channel. So go check that out. And um, finally, the early Christian quotes I use can be found on the CD-ROM version of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, which you can purchase for $5 on the Scroll Publishing website, scrollpublishing.com. All right, well, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get episode 94 rolling. All right, well, in part one of this series, I talked about total depravity. And what I did for you is I gave you some lengthy quotes from both John Calvin and John Piper so that they could define for you and explain for you the Calvinistic position on total depravity. I want to stay away from straw men arguments at all costs. I also gave you the early Christian position on total depravity. And so let me sum up for you uh, those positions. Here's uh, John Piper he said, in, in summary, total depravity means that our rebellion against God is total. Everything we do in this rebellion is sinful. Our inability to submit to God or reform ourselves is total, and we are therefore totally deserving of eternal punishment. Here is uh, Tertullian giving a short summary of the early Christian position. Tertullian said, there is a portion of good in the soul of that original divine and genuine good, which is its proper nature for that, which is derived from God is rather obscured than extinguished. Thus, some men are very bad and some are very good, but even in the worst, there is something good and in the best there is something bad for God alone is without sin. And the only man without sin is Christ since Christ is also God. All right. So the early Christians believed that though uh, the human nature is corrupted, it's not totally corrupt. And as theologians like R.C. Sproul will discuss Total depravity is what all of the other four points of TULIP hang on. So let's go ahead and get into that second uh, part of Calvinism, second point in Calvinism, unconditional election. This is John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion in Book 3, Chapter 21 in Section 5. He writes, The predestination by which God adopts some people to the hope of life 
and it judges others to eternal death, no man who would be thought pious ventures simply to deny. But it is greatly argued about, especially by those who make prescience its cause. We indeed ascribe both prescience and predestination to God, but we say that it is absurd to make the latter subordinate to the former. When we attribute prescience, this is foreknowledge basically, to God, we mean that all things always were and ever continue under his eye. That is, to his knowledge, there is no past or future, but all things are present, and indeed so present, that it is not merely the idea of them that is set before him, as those objects are which we retain in our memory, but that he truly sees and contemplates them as actually under his immediate inspection. The prescience extends to the whole circuit of the world and to all creatures. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation, and, accordingly, each has been created for one or the other of these ends. We say, that he has been predestinated to life or to death. Skipping to part seven, we say then that scripture clearly provides this much, that God by his eternal and immutable counsel determined once for all those whom it was his pleasure one day to admit to salvation and those whom on the other hand it was his pleasure to doom to destruction. We maintain that this counsel, as regards to the, to the elect, is founded on his free mercy without any respect to human worth, while those whom he dooms to destruction are excluded from access to life by a just and blameless, but at the same time incomprehensible judgment. All right. Unconditional election defined by John Calvin. Here is John Piper in his book, Five Points. This is starting on page 53 as he defines unconditional election. Piper writes, It is clear that the salvation of any of us is owing to God's election. He chose those whom he would show such irresistible grace and for whom he would purchase it. Election refers to God's choosing whom to save. It is unconditional in that there is no condition man must meet before God chooses to save him. Man is dead in trespasses and sins, so there is no condition he can meet before God chooses to save him from his deadness. We are not saying that final salvation is unconditional. It is not. We must meet the condition of faith, for example, in Christ in order to inherit eternal life. But faith is not a condition for election. Just the reverse. Election is a condition for faith. It is because God chose us before the foundation of the world that he purchases our redemption at the cross and then gives us spiritual life through the irresistible grace and brings us to faith. But what about the early Christians? Did they believe that there was a precondition to election? Here's Justin in Justin Martyr in 160 AD. He says, if the word of God retells that some angels and men will be certainly punished, it did so because it foreknew that they would be unchangeable. However, this is not because God created them so, for all who wish for it can obtain mercy from God if they repent. Here's one of Justin's disciples, Tatian, around the same year, 160. 
the power of the Logos has in itself a faculty to foresee future events. Yet, these events are not fated, but take place by the choice of free agents. For the Logos foretold from time to time the issues of things to come. All right, here's Tertullian around the year 207, speaking of King Saul. He writes, Saul is chosen, for he is not yet the despiser of the prophet Samuel. Solomon is rejected, for he has now become a prey to foreign women and a slave to the idols of Moab and Sidon. What must the Creator do in order to escape the censure of the Marcionites? He must prematurely condemn men who are thus far correct in their conduct just because of future delinquencies? Yet it is not the mark of a good God to condemn beforehand persons who have not yet deserved condemnation. All right, here's Irenaeus around the year 180 in his uh, book four against heresies, chapter 39, starting in section three. The light does not fail because of those who have blinded themselves, but while it remains the same as ever, those who are thus blinded are involved in darkness through their own fault. The light does never enslave anyone by necessity, nor again does God exercise compulsion upon anyone unwilling to accept the exercise of his skill. Those persons, therefore, who have apostatized from the light given by the Father and transgressed the law of liberty have done so through their own fault, since they have been created free agents and possessed of power over themselves. But God, foreknowing all things, prepared fit habitations for both, kindly conferring that light which they desire upon those who seek after the light of incorruption and resort to it. But for the despisers and mockers who avoid and turn themselves away from this light and who do, as it were, blind themselves, he has prepared darkness suitable to persons who oppose the light and he has inflicted an appropriate punishment upon those who try to avoid being subject to him. Submission to God is eternal rest, so that they who shun the light have a place worthy of their flight, and those who fly from eternal rest have a habitation in accordance with their fleeing. Now, since all good things are with God, they by their own determination fly from God, do defraud themselves of all good things, and having been thus the defrauded of all good things with respect to God, they shall consequently fall under the just judgment of God. For those persons who shun rest shall justly incur punishment, and those who avoid the light shall justly dwell in darkness. For as in the case of this temporal light, those who shun it do deliver themselves over to darkness so that they do themselves become the cause to themselves that they are destitute of light and do not inhabit darkness. And as I have already observed, the light is not the cause of such an unhappy condition of existence to them. So those who fly from the eternal light of God, which contains in itself all good things, are themselves the cause to themselves of the inhabiting eternal light of their inhabiting eternal darkness, destitute of all good things, having become to themselves the cause of their consignment to an abode of that nature. All right, so the early Christian's position was that God foreknows how free agents will choose, and he has determined that those who have the ability to choose right because of his grace given to them and they choose right, they will be forever with him. And those who by his grace have the ability to choose right from wrong, yet choose wrong, will not be with him. They will be eternally punished. So uh, he has chosen those who by grace through faith choose him. It is not an arbitrary choosing of God. All right. 
Let's go ahead and go to limited atonement. Now, with limited atonement, you're going to be hard pressed to find John Calvin uh, explaining this concept in his Institutes of Christian Religion. I mean, I certainly did. I found an easier uh, reference to this belief in his commentary on 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And that is the verse that says, If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So this is Calvin's commentary on 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And by the way, as I said in the previous episode, I'll have links to all of these uh, citations in the show notes. All right. Calvin writes, and not for ours only, he added this for the sake of amplifying in order that the faithful might be assured that the expiation made by Christ extends to all who by faith embrace the gospel. But here a question may be raised. How have the sins of the whole world been expiated? I pass by the foolishness of the fanatics who under this pretense extend salvation to all the reprobate and therefore to Satan himself. Such a monstrous thing deserves no refutation. They who seek to avoid this absurdity have said that Christ suffered sufficiently for the whole world, but efficiently for only the elect. This solution has commonly prevailed in the schools. Though then I allow that what has been said is true, yet I deny that it is suitable to this passage. For the design of John was no other than to make this benefit common to the whole church. Then, under the word all or whole, he does not include the reprobate, but designates those who should believe as well as those who who were then scattered through various parts of the world. For then is really made evident, as it is meet, the grace of Christ when it is declared to be the only true salvation of the world. All right, so that's Calvin. Here's Piper in, uh, page, on page 40 and 45. Piper writes, In order to say that Christ died for all men in the same way, They must limit the atonement to a possibility or an opportunity for salvation if fallen humans can escape from their deadness and rebellion and obtain faith by an effectual means not provided by the cross. On the other hand, we do not limit the power and effectiveness of the atonement. Rather, we say that in the cross, God had in view the actual effective redemption of his children from all that would destroy them, including their own unbelief. And we affirm that when Christ died particularly for his bride, he did not simply create a possibility or an opportunity for salvation, but really purchased and infallibly secured for them all that is necessary for them to get saved, including the grace of regeneration and the gift of faith. In the death of Christ, God secures a definite group of unworthy sinners as his own people by purchasing and guaranteeing the conditions that they must meet to be a part of his people. The blood of the covenant, Christ's blood, purchases and guarantees the new heart of faith and repentance. God did not do this for everyone. He did it for a definite or particular group owing to nothing in themselves. All right, so just very clearly, you can tell that Piper and Calvin are saying that Christ only died for the church. All right, so here's Justin Martyr in Dialogue with Trifo the Jew around 160. This is in uh, chapter... 95. He writes, Christ took upon himself the curse due to us. For the whole human race will be found to be under a curse. 
For it is written in the law of Moses, cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And no one has accurately done all, nor will you venture to deny this, but some more and some less than others have observed the ordinances enjoined. But if those who are under this law appear to be under a curse for not having observed all the requirements, how much more shall all the nations appear to be under a curse who practice idolatry, who seduce youths, and commit other crimes? If then the Father of all wished his Christ for the whole human family to take upon him the curses of all, knowing that after he had been crucified and and was dead, he would raise him up. His father caused him to suffer these things in behalf of the human family, yet you did not commit the deed as in obedience to the will of God. For you did not practice piety when you slew the prophets. And let none of you say, if his father wished him to suffer this, in order that by his stripes the human race might be healed, we have done no wrong. If indeed you repent of your sins and recognize him to be the Christ and observe his commandments, then you may assert this. For as I have said before, remissions of remission of sins shall be yours. All right. Here's uh, origin against Celsus. This is around uh, in, the, in the middle of the uh, third century. Origen writes, This statement also is untrue that it is only foolish and low individuals and persons devoid of perception and slaves and women and children of whom the teachers of the divine word wish to make converts. Such indeed does the gospel invite in order to make them better, but it invites also others who are very different from these since Christ is the Savior of all men and especially of them that believe whether they be intelligent or simple. And he is the propitiation with the Father for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. God loves all existing things and loathes nothing which he has made, for he would not have created anything in hatred. The earth is full of the mercy of the Lord, and that the mercy of the Lord is upon all flesh, and that God being good, makes his son to rise upon the evil and the good and sends rain upon the just and the unjust, and that he encourages us to a similar course of action in order that we may become his sons and teaches us to extend the benefits which we enjoy so far as in our power to all men. For he himself is said to be the savior of all men, especially of them that believe and his Christ to be the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Here's Origen in his commentary on John chapter 6, and this is in uh, part 37 of the effects of the death of Christ, of his triumph after it, and of the removal by his death of the sins of men. He writes, We have lingered over this subject of the martyrs and over the record of those who died on account of pestilence, because this lets us see the excellence of him who was led as a sheep to the slaughter and was silent as a lamb before the shearer. For if there is any point in these stories of the Greeks, and if what we have said of the martyrs is well founded, the apostles too were for the same reason the filth of the world and the, obs- the offscouring of all things, offscouring of all things. What and how great things must be said of the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for this reason, that he might take away the sin not of a few, but of the whole world, for the sake of which also he suffered. If any one sin, we read, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for those of the whole world, since he is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. All right, well, like I said at the beginning of the first 
a part of this this series. I'm not trying to say the early Christians are right and the Calvinists are wrong. That's not the point of this uh, podcast. The point of this series is to just let you see what the early Christians actually believed about these doctrines uh, taught by Reformed theologians. And hopefully, as you as you heard, the earliest Christians did not believe in total depravity. They did not believe in an unconditional election. They believed that those whom God foreknew would choose him by faith. He elected for sonship and salvation, and that Jesus did die for everyone, thus giving everyone the opportunity to experience his grace. Okay, so that's the early Christian position on the first three uh, doctrines of TULIP. In two weeks, you will be able to hear our last part, part three, where we will discuss irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints. And I pray this has been a blessing to you. God bless you.